Welcome to the Starfleet Leadership Academy. Leadership development told through the lens of Star Trek. Your host, Jeff Aiken, is a 20-year veteran of the public and private sectors in management and leadership. He specializes in helping people unlock their true potential and is a huge Star Trek fan. And now, here's your host, Jeff Aiken. Welcome. Happy Captain Picard Week. I have a very special episode for you today as part of Captain Picard Week from Strange New Pod. If you're hearing this on their feed, it's great to meet you. If you're hearing this on the Starfleet Leadership Academy feed, take a minute and go check out Strange New Pod. Not only will you find a fantastic Star Trek podcast, but you'll get to hear from the other 13 or some odd podcasts involved in this epic event. And and I'm even part of one of them. Hawk from Strange New Pod and I were able to join Matthew with Trek Untold to talk about trauma and Picard's experience with the Borg. You should go check it out. Here on the Starfleet Leadership Academy, we're going to talk about, yep, Picard as a leader. I'm going to dive into some great episodes that highlight five of the qualities that make Picard one of if not the definitive leader and captain in Star Trek. Now let's make it so. The original series has been off the air for 53 years and the next generation for 28. Yet the debate rages on. Kirk or Picard? People have really really strong feelings on this, and honestly, there isn't a clear winner. But I disagree with the debate itself. You see, leadership can look a lot of different ways. And with the exception of Captain Lorca and Captain Archer, Star Trek is full of amazing examples of leadership. Okay, that... That wasn't fair. Archer takes some time to ramp up, but he gets there. Eventually, after some time, it's cool. But still, if I asked most anyone who the best leader in Star Trek is, a whole bunch of them are going to say our man of the week, Jean-Luc Picard. But why? What makes him stand out over everyone else? I mean, Kirk is responsible for a bunch of successful diplomatic missions. Janeway mostly adhered to Federation ideals even when it would have been easier to forego them. Cisco brought a team of people from different governments, cultures, and societies together and helped them achieve, achieve impossible things. So why Picard? We're gonna look, we're gonna look at five specific things that he did that answer that question. Now, all of the captains did most of these things to, to one degree or another, but Picard did them consistently and he did them at a galaxy class level. He met people where they were at. He leaned on others and asked for help. He stood up for the members of his team. He helped his team to grow and develop, and he would always seize the moment. So let's look into each one of these. When I say that Picard meets people where they're at, or or can speak in ways that they can understand, you know, that are meaningful to them, I'll bet that we all immediately think of the same thing. Let's watch it. Why? The children of Tama were called incomprehensible by Captain Silvestri of the Shikamaru. Other accounts were comparable. It's pretty important. Cause for concern. For all we know, they could be threatening our border. Everything in the previous account suggests a peaceful race. So what we're really starting with here is a group of people Agreed. that they don't know a lot about, rules, and all the history Starfleet says that we cannot that communicate with them. Extended a hand. We must... So if you remember this episode, Picard and um, this Tamarian captain are stranded on the planet's surface, and they need to figure out a way to communicate with each other. They're really struggling. So here's an example of Picard just, just trying to... Uh, trying to get a piece of, of, of what's going on. Timber. Timber. What does that mean? Fire. Does timber mean fire? He's asking questions. Timber. He's trying. His arms wide. Timber is a person. His arms wide. 
because he's he's holding them apart in in generosity in giving okay let's watch this next piece now, this seems incredible really it sets the stage for how incredible picard really is so what we're gonna watch is troy just being exasperated here so let's let's check this out really quick see what she has to say all our technology and experience our universal translator our years in space contact with more alien cultures than i can even remember all this stuff on their side right technology and tools and everything but what it comes down to is picard putting himself where someone else is and finding a way finding a way to communicate with them let's skip ahead and see what happens later Sonic, his army at Lashmere. Lashmere. Was it like this at Lashmere? A similar situation to the one we're facing here. Freaking out, right? The stakes are super high, and he's still trying to find a way to communicate non-verbally, verbally, any way he possibly can. So this is where it all comes to a head, right? The Enterprise is battling the Temerian vessel. It's not looking good. Picard, just back up from the surface, comes in and lays down everything that he's learned. Cinder! His face black, his eyes red. Tamak. The river Tamak. In winter. Tamak. And Jalan. At Tanagra. And there it is. Picard was able to find a way to speak in a language the Temerians understood. He met, he met them where they're at. But that's not all he does. Another great example of this is in an episode that I think a lot of Star Trek fans tend to forget about, which is honestly a real travesty. This isn't going to be the only time that I'm going to reference the Ensigns of Command in this episode. It's got a lot of good in it. It's also, it's also a really special episode for me. Before my mom passed away in May of 2020, the last thing that we did together was watch this episode. So now let's look at it right now and, and, and see how, how Picard did this. So in this first scene, the Ensigns of Command that we're going to look at, Troy is really helping Picard to kind of figure out what's going on. The Sheliak are this uh, species that communicate in a very uh, unique, very formal kind of a way, more similar, more uh, you know, familiar to us than what we experienced with the Temerians just a second ago. But um, what you'll see when this all pays off is just how difficult it is to communicate with them. But Troy, and this is going to hit on one of the other things we're talking about, Troy's helping him out, figuring this, uh, figuring out how to best communicate with him. We are stranded on a planet. We have no language in common, but I want to teach you mine. It's a Smarith. What did I just say? Cup. Glass. Are you See? sure? I yeah. may have meant liquid, clear, brown. A lot hot. of this pays off, you know, in the we in Darmok and in other the universe episodes too. in relatively the same way. Point taken. It's fantastic. So he works really hard to understand how the Sheliak communicate. Let's skip ahead and see how this eventually pays off. So they get the Sheliak up. He's got everything Coming figured through, out. Sir. Check this out. Pursuant to paragraph 1290, I hereby formally request third party arbitration of our dispute. You have. I mean, it's right. familiar, right? Furthermore, pursuant to subsection D3, I name the Grizellas to arbitrate. It's all Grizellas. about understanding what's important to the Unfortunately, they are Shelly currently act. in their hibernation cycle. However, they will awaken in six months, at which time we can get this matter settled. Now, do you want to wait? Or give me my three weeks? See, he, he finds a way to connect with the Sheliak in a way that is meaningful to them. And through that, able to get exactly what he's looking for. Now, what he's doing in these examples is using knowledge, 
empathy and patience to understand the person that he's communicating with. This is absolutely critical for leaders. Understanding the cultures and experiences of the people that you're leading or working with or even living with is what you need to be able to do to communicate effectively and to stand out as a leader. The enterprise has just encountered the Borg for the first time ever. They are outclassed. They are outmatched. There is nothing they can do and they're ready to fight to the bitter end to do what needs to happen. But Q, Q's the one who put him here. Picard, oh, just watch. This is, this is incredible. You thought you could handle it, so handle it. Q, end this. Moi, what makes you think I'm either inclined or capable to terminate this encounter? If we all die here, now, you will not be able to gloat. He knows what's important to Q. He wanted to frighten us. We're frightened. He's admitting what has happened. He wanted to show us His that we were inadequate. For the moment, I grant that. He wanted me to say, I need you. I need you. There it is, right there. Picard asks for help. He admits vulnerability, and the Enterprise is saved. For now. What a nightmare of a situation, right? From this moment, Star Trek changed forever. In fact, check out the Trek Untold podcast contribution to Captain Picard Week for a deep dive on what happens to Picard, ultimately, really as a result of, of this very episode. But what's awesome here is Picard didn't think that he could save the day himself. He didn't try to be the hero. Now, I'll bet you have absolutely worked with or maybe even lived with people that don't act this way, right? They think they can do it all themselves. And if your experience is at all like mine, yeah, uh, they were not able to do so. <laughs> and really, they caused a lot more damage by trying to be the hero than they could have just asked someone else for help. Leaders understand that teams are better with absolutely everyone involved. This is the magic of diversity. Bringing together a group of people with different life experiences from different cultures, different levels of education, different interests, always creates better ideas and better plans of action. Picard knows this. He gets it. And even, even in an absolute embarrassment of an episode. Can't believe I'm going to use this one, but we're going to do it. In this terrible, terrible episode of Star Trek, Picard shows us the importance of leaning on others and asking for help. I am so sorry. I am so sorry to bring Code of Honor into this, but there's just a couple couple little little pieces of it we're gonna watch. So let's let's get into this first one because it really just, mm, it's perfect. I felt something else, something more like avarice or ambition. Just taking some taking some other comments. Boom! There it is. I'm gonna go back. We got we have to listen to that again. I talked over it. Briefing studies was there. Or ambition. Yar's been abducted. He needs help. Other comments? <sighs> if I may, sir. Oh my gosh. One of the things about the How incredible was their respect is that patience. moment. I, I can almost play it again. Okay. I'll get to the other one. We and don't want to spend too much time. Ritualistic way they do th things aren't looking good. Things are not looking good. So Yar's gonna have to battle Yarina. Uh, the vaccine is at risk. Everything's falling apart and, and <laughs> This again, I'm just I'm just gonna let this moment speak for itself. Here we go, let's watch. I'm your counselor. You brought me with you to Legon to be of help. And help me, please. Then help me, please. Captain Picard, Jean Luc Picard, asking for help, taking it, and spoiler alert, things turn out okay for Yar in this episode. <laughs> too soon? Maybe too soon. Honestly, if that's all of that episode you watch for the rest of your life, you're, you're probably better. 
better for it. But but Picard Picard shows his skill, and honestly, he shows his power by leaning on others. He's not afraid to ask for help and then accept that help. This might seem counterintuitive, but in asking for help and then letting other people shine by offering that help, even, even maybe letting them save the day, Picard's the one that benefits. He's the one that looks like an amazing leader. He's not giving anything away. He's helping everyone be better as a result of asking for help. And a real, a real measure of how you help your team and how you help develop them right through, through, through these opportunities is, is how they grow. And holy crud, is there anyone that has invested more in his team members than Picard? I mean, let's just look at some simple facts right here. Let's look at all the people that worked with Picard that went on to captain their own starships. Now, a little caveat, Star Trek, right? We always have to have a little caveat. But some of these were alternate timelines. But even those alternate timelines were based on the prime timeline. They're based on Picard's relationship with these people. So me, this is, this is my show, this is my episode. I'm gonna count them. So let's go down the list. And honestly, if I forget anybody, don't hesitate to let me know. I'm on all the social media at Jeff T. Aiken. So let's start with the obvious one, right? Riker. He went on to command the USS Titan. That's not it. Beverly Crusher, in all good things, was captain of the USS Pasteur. Geordi LaForge had the Challenger in Voyager's Timeless. And in the Picard novel, The Last Best Hope, Worf took command of the Enterprise after Picard was promoted. Most recently, we got to see Sonia Gomez taking command of the USS Archimedes in the Lower Decks episode, First, First Contact. Now, I mean, Kirk was great, right? I love Kirk. But he had what? Spock uh, commanded the Enterprise for a hot minute. Sulu went on to be the captain of the Excelsior. That would have been a really cool TV series if that happened. Right? Yeah, I think so too. But others, like Chekhov, they had some success in the novels, but back in the TOS and kind of TNG times, it was the Wild West as far as continuity and stuff went in those novels. But Picard, Picard did a thing in like the main, just the, I hate to use the word, but in the canon of Star Trek, Captain Picard, as a leader, created more leaders. And I love how he did it. Part of it was trusting them and relying on them, like we talked about just a few minutes ago. But also, and this is huge, he allowed them to fail. There are too many that believe that failure is not an option, that failure is the worst thing that could happen. Picard knows that that's not the case. Picard understands that it's only in failure that we can learn. And in this absolutely legendary, iconic moment of Star Trek, a quote we all know, and most all of us have used, even explains that failure, or the lack of failure, doesn't, doesn't even mean success, right? But he's going to say it so much better than I can. Let's listen in. Data, you were my first officer. I have not been able to isolate the problem, sir. I might make a mistake. I might make a mistake. How many of us have chosen to not do a thing because of how data feels right now? Oh, if only we all had a Picard in our lives. Listen. Yes, you might. But that does not alter your duty to me and to this ship. Now, do you know how to formulate a premise? Yes, sir. Then formulate this one. How do I deal with Commander Riker and the Hathaway? I would await your answer on the bridge. And Commander, it is possible to commit no mistakes and still lose. That is not a weakness. That is life. That is life. Oh, so good. 
And then back to Ensigns of Command. Told you it wouldn't be only mentioned once in this one. Data is really in over his head. Picard, though, allows him the space to, to feel it out, to, to do his thing, to ultimately make mistakes and then learn from those mistakes. So here, this is back to the Ensigns of Command. Data needs to evacuate all of these colonists here. But this guy, right, this guy right here, he, he's having none of it. He's been trying really hard to sway the hearts and minds of everybody, but here's where it all comes to a head. It's over. Don't you get it? You had your say. You're lost. I appear to be reversing that defeat. Data looking at no, it you're through not. good eyes? You're just stubborn. Well, let me tell you something. Now that changes things a little bit, right? See, Data got a little too confident. He doesn't have backup with him. He made a series of mistakes leading up to this, had a hard time really convincing people that this was the right thing to do. But Picard trusted him to do this, to make his mistakes, to learn from them, figure out how to get to a good outcome. Let's see what happens. Now through this, Data's been trying to convince people, taking the slow route, but he just, he just can't change their minds in there. And so he takes a different approach based on what he's learned, based on what he's seen from Picard. They may not offer you a target. They can obliterate you from orbit. You will die. Never having seen the faces of your killers. Sometimes you just gotta be blunt. You just gotta tell them how it is. is yours. We've seen this from Picard so many times and here's the payoff. There are other places, other challenges. Yes. Yes. <laughs> The mission accomplished, Data heads back to Picard to report in, and what we're gonna watch here is just a masterful, masterful stroke that Captain Picard uses to highlight first the success of Data, but then use something different to help kind of pull together his lesson learned from his experience with the colonists. Watch this. Come. Pretty standard stuff. Captain, did my job, everything's great, Captain well, says. Well done, Mr. Data, well done. Thank you, sir. Yeah, good job. That's great. Good doctor was kind enough to provide me with a recording of your concert. And here it is. Your performance shows feeling. As I have recently reminded others, sir, I have no feeling. It's hard to believe. The playing is quite beautiful. It's so great because he uses a thing out of context to really drive home what matters and, and, and the lesson learned for Data. This is exactly how Picard helps the people on his team develop and grow. TNG really dove in to the personal lives of a lot of the characters. Like, honestly, that's a thing that I miss in the Trek that we're getting today. It's all, it's also focused on the overarching story, so we don't get to spend a lot of time with the crew, the extra characters in there. Now, back in the day, some of this was kind of filler stuff that might have been fun, didn't influence much, but, you know, just kind of filled in an episode. While some of it, <coughs> Sabrosa, <coughs> excuse me, some of it was just bad, right? <laughs> Not good at all. But sometimes, sometimes they went really deep and did some really cool stuff. Let's take Worf as an example. Worf wanted to grow up more than anything else. He wasn't a Toys R Us kid. No, all he wanted to do was be a Klingon and be accepted as being a Klingon. And even that got taken away from him. If you remember in the episode Sins of the Father, he received a discommendation from the Klingon High Council. And for someone that wants nothing more than, than to belong, to be recognized for who he is, this was almost worse than death. Now, there are two things I want you to watch for in this clip. First, we'll see in passing as the camera comes around here. We'll just kind of start this. As the camera comes around, right, we're going to see Picard standing there. Standing there, right there. Side by side with Worf. It's the worst thing that's ever happened to him. Also. Brother. He needs his blood, his brother to turn his back on him. Imagine. But here's the next thing. 
Just watch Picard. Just watch what happens here. In Worf's lowest moment, Picard stands with him. And as the series continues, Picard stands right at his side to help him learn from this and grow from it. Honestly, if it weren't for Picard mentoring and supporting Worf through specifically his discommendation, I doubt he would have been in a position to command the Enterprise or or even the Defiant like he did in Deep Space Nine. Now this... This is the perfect segue into the fourth thing we're going to talk about. When you lead a large team or you're leading a politically challenging project or task, you're going to be faced with people on your teams that are being questioned or even, even outright attacked. I remember, I remember a teammate of mine not too long ago. It was a victim of harassment by a really valuable customer of ours. She frankly, she frankly wasn't safe being left alone with them. Now, the easy thing to do would have been to either remove her from the role, put somebody else in it, right? Just kind of move the problem out of the way. Or to have actually sided with the the customer because honestly, their business is really important to us. But the right thing to do, which is what I did do, was hold hold the customer accountable and really whisking our business with them going forward. I decided to stand up for her, even though it was more difficult. It was hard to do and a huge risk. But where do you think, where do you think I learned how to do that? Where do you think my example was, huh? Yep. Captain Jean-Luc Picard. We all know this scene. We all know what's coming. But this is Picard taking the difficult road. This is Picard standing up for his team. Now tell me, Commander, what is Data? I don't understand. What is he? A machine. Is he? Are you sure? Yes. You see, he's met two of your three criteria for sentience, so what if he meets the third? Consciousness in even the smallest degree. What is he then? I don't know. Do you? Do you? Oh, so good. Asking those questions, challenging everything, and the scene goes on. We all know it so well. But this is what it looks like. This is what it looks like to take that harder, that more difficult, that riskier route. Now we could do a whole deep dive into what Riker did here and the turmoil and the conflict he must have experienced. Maybe we'll do that when he gets his own show and it's Will Riker week. Huh? Maybe. But like I said, it would have been so easy, in this case, to have just agreed with Maddox, handed data over. But instead, Picard took the more difficult, the riskier route. And what we know from here is that Data and Maddox actually end up forming a great relationship. And Data goes on, you know, to do all the amazing things that we know he did. And Maddox, well, go back and watch the first season of Picard. See what happened with that one. And there's another great example of Picard doing the same thing for someone else that it would have been much easier just to leave them to themselves. Let's check it out. Another absolutely iconic scene right here, and it's again the same thing. Picard choosing to stand up for his team, for a member of his team, arguably an insignificant member of his team. But he does it because it's the right thing to do. It's what a leader, the caliber of Captain Picard does. Here we go. I'm deeply concerned about what is happening here. It began when we apprehended a spy, a man who admitted his guilt and who will answer for his crime. But the hunt didn't end there. Another man, Mr. Simon Tarsius, was brought to trial. And it was a trial, no matter what others choose to call it. A trial based on insinuation and innuendo. Nothing substantive offered against Mr. Tarsus, much less proven. He's risking a lot here. Have we become so 
fearful? Have we become so cowardly that we must extinguish a man because he carries the blood of a current enemy? Admiral, let us not condemn Simon Tarsis or anyone else because of their bloodlines. It's challenging. Or investigate Admiral. others for their innocent associations. I implore you, do not continue with this proceeding. End it now. End it. He's looking an admiral in the face. He's questioning a legendary judge in all of this that he's saying. He's putting it all on the line for just one member of his team. Finally, he showed that it's important to make the most of every moment we have. Now, he had the benefit of living an entire second lifetime to come by some of this wisdom, but still, it applies and we can all learn from it. And in all of this, he shows a lesson that I remind myself of a lot. You see, I like who I am. I like me. And I like what I get to do with my life. And what that means is that there's nothing in my life that I, I would change. I wouldn't change a single thing about what's happened to me in my whole life. All of that came together to make me who I am right now. It takes Q to help Picard see this, but he definitely does. And here Picard comes face to face with that fact, right? He did not seize the moment when he was young, which put his path, his life on an entirely different path. Q shows him this. The Jean-Luc Picard you wanted to be, the one who did not fight the Nausicaan, had quite a different career from the one you remember. That Picard never had a brush with death, never came face to face with his own mortality, never realized how fragile life is or how important each moment must be. So his life never came into focus. He drifted through much of his career with no plan or agenda, going from one assignment to the next, never seizing the opportunities that presented themselves. He never led the away team on Milica III to save the ambassador. Or take charge of the Stargazer's bridge when its captain was killed. These are the things that made Picard who he is now, right? And as we've seen, he builds that for every member of his team. But here he understands more than anywhere else that the things that we did in our lives are what make us who we are. I can't think of a better way to wrap up this look at Picard as a leader as part of Strange New Pod's Captain Picard Week than seeing Picard and Q together. We're going to be seeing a lot more of that, I think, coming up. Thank you so much to Strange New Pod for inviting me and the Starfleet Leadership Academy to be a part of Captain Picard Week. The new season premiere is, I think it might be tomorrow, if you're listening or watching this live. Yeah but it's coming up here really soon. Be sure to check out all of the podcasts that participated in Captain Picard Week. Go subscribe to Strange New Pod, catch them all. And if you're listening to this on the Strange New Pod feed, subscribe to the Starfleet Leadership Academy wherever you listen to podcasts. Thank you all, and ex astra scientia. Ex astra scientia.